it's uh, good to see you all. Glad many of you are, are back today. Um, I do have to mention just on the outset that uh, I'm sorry to disappoint everybody, uh, especially all the college students who came because they were told that they were going to hear a sermon on the rich, rich men and Lazarus. Uh, but uh, that's not what I'm preaching on this morning. So uh, we're, we're going to be looking at... Uh, Luke chapter 16, just one verse. It's going to be Luke 16, verse 18. And so if you have your Bibles or your devices, if you would turn there. And if you have the Pew Bibles, it's on page 1,626. And so just to catch us up, uh, last week uh, we heard some hard words from our Lord concerning the law of man versus the law of the kingdom. And Jesus taught us that we're to desire his Kingdom law, because the law of man is an abomination in God's sight and will lead to judgment. Uh, Jesus also made it clear that to force our way into the kingdom, we must rest our faith in the one who fulfilled the law himself. Uh, because apart from faith in Jesus, who makes us new creatures through the Holy Spirit that empowers us, we would be doomed to try and achieve every dot of the law on our own. We would end up just like the Pharisees, uh, trying to live by some law of man. Today we come to a very sensitive topic, or sensitive topics, uh, that have touched many people's lives, which is divorce and remarriage. And as I was talking with Buddy Hawk this week, he looked at me and said, most preachers avoid preaching on those things. And so um, I can't do that, because this is where we're at in the texts. But uh, our task today, as we approach these difficult subjects uh, is to discern, first of all, why Jesus has it in the flow of our text in chapter 16, and then also to discern his teachings so that we come away with a more biblical and helpful understanding of such complex subjects as divorce and remarriage. And so, we're just reading one verse from Luke chapter 16, verse 18. This is God's word to us this morning. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. This is God's word. Would you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, as we approach such um, a tough text, Lord, I ask that you would just open our hearts and our minds um, so that we can receive uh, what your word is saying. Lord, help me to be clear uh, in my presentation uh, of these things as well, Lord, so that we can uh, not just be hearers of your word, but so that we can take it uh, and be better builders of your kingdom as we seek to apply those things that are right and good uh, as we live out uh, our lives as your kingdom ambassadors and as representatives of your gospel. Lord, empower us through the Spirit uh, to do all of these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week I introduced the concept of God's law still being into uh, still being in effect, still being the standard that binds us as believers who are children in God's kingdom. And as we approach the one verse we're going to unpack today, I felt the need to clarify what the kingdom law is once more and why it is important for us to practice it as followers of Jesus. So the law that we are under is what is commonly called the moral law of God. It's the reflection of God's Nature that has always been present since the beginning of time that he put into writing when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. It's also what Jesus summarized in his two great commandments. So we don't need to be circumcised. We don't need to follow sacrificial laws, kosher laws, or other judicial laws of the Old Testament, Mosaic Covenant, because Jesus put those to an end. But he did not put the two great commandments to an end because they reflect uh, that we are to love God through our service to what he asks of us in his word. And as we seek to do this, we, as we obey his law, we will love our neighbors too. So we do not obey this law because we hope with legalistic uh, expectations to be made right with God. We're not adding to our salvation when we obey God's word. We are proving our love for our God through our obedience to it. And it's only possible because we have the power of the Holy Spirit that indwells us as new creatures, as I said before. But it's important for us to seek obedience to the great, two great commandments as we learn them in the scriptures, because if we embody God's holy character as we practice them, this provides justice equally to all people who are judged by this law. God's standards are impartial, meaning that everyone is treated equally in the justice system 
of God. And if we disobey God's standards, his perfect and impartial law that brings true liberty and blessing to everyone that is judged by it or that it's applied to, then we are practicing what is called injustice. God's law never produces injustice to any person when it is rightly obeyed, which is why we want to follow it the best to the best of our ability, because as we approach uh, our text today uh, with such difficult topics um, as divorce and remarriage, using a false understanding of these things or a, a wrong interpretation of God's word, our conclusions will cause injustice. They could cause emotional, spiritual, and really holistic harm to those who have been affected by these difficult relational breakdowns. So it's my hope that as we treat this passage with care, uh, we'll learn how to be arbiters of true justice as we obey God's word and law as his kingdom representatives and ambassadors of his gospel. Now with that being said, I must give the caveat that I am in no way addressing the topics of divorce and remarriage exhaustively here this morning. These are extremely complex issues, and as a pastor, uh, each uh, case has to be treated uh, individually and with great care. And so, But we are going to try to discern Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage this morning from our text. So we're going to do that first by breaking down divorce, and second by briefly addressing remarriage. So breaking down divorce. So the Pharisees have responded negatively to the teaching Jesus gave his disciples. They were angry that Jesus would point out their sin of greed and pride, and they began to ridicule Jesus, to scoff at him, which led Jesus to respond uh, to their arrogance with a harsh rebuke concerning their self-righteousness and justifying themselves by laws of man rather than the law of God's kingdom. And it was in the conclusion of Jesus' rebuke that he made it clear that no one can force his way into the kingdom of God through faulty means. It must be done by the fulfillment of the law of God, which is through faith in Christ alone. And we saw this in verse 14 through 17 from last week, where it reads, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law of the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. And then Jesus said the following words that we are focusing on today as he continued his teaching, his rebuke to the Pharisees. He says this, Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So Jesus was continuing his response to the Pharisees, making it very clear that they were not trying to obey God's kingdom law. And he, refused, and he used the teaching of divorce and remarriage as a test case to show once more that the Pharisees were clueless about God's righteous standards, making it clear that divorce, as it was being practiced by the Pharisees, was leading them into adultery. They were breaking their marriage covenants sinfully. Again, as we read verse 18, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees who were dissolving their marriage covenants haphazardly. Their marriages were not being dissolved on grounds that God had determined as acceptable. They had justified their divorces based on faulty understandings of his word, uh, just as we learned from a background parallel passage in Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to work through this because it uncovers a lot of stuff that we need to know to rightly focus in and address Luke, verse 18 here. So I'm going to read this passage, and it's a lot here, but uh, it's necessary for us to continue breaking this down. So Matthew 19, verse 3 through 12, we read this. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two but one flesh. But therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, 
Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Now, I understand there's a lot there. We're not going to cover everything. But as we break down divorce, it is clear that divorce is a reality in a sinful world. Divorce is assumed to be a reality by Jesus in our passage in Luke and in the passage we just read from Matthew. And in each passage, Jesus treats divorce with serious concern because it is a serious sin. It's serious sin because divorce is a direct assault on the first and most foundational human relationship given to God to bless the earth, marriage. Pharisees were not interested in ways they could preserve their marriages as God had intended. Rather, they were concerned whether they might be justified in divorcing their wives for any reason at all. And they asked this question because it was a common teaching at that time by one of the rabbis in Jesus' day, known by the name of Hillel, that a Jewish man could divorce his wife for basically any reason, even for something so petty as ruining his dinner. This nonchalant acceptance and participation in divorce is why Jesus addressed the Pharisees as he did. Divorce is antithetical to what God originally intended. Jesus had a Genesis view of marriage, and so did God. And that's why Jesus quoted Genesis chapter 2 as he responded to the Pharisees. He quoted this passage. We'll read a little bit broader of the quotation. He says this from Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. We read, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so this was Jesus' view of marriage, but the Pharisees did not take the same view of marriage that Jesus did. They had taken a different view of marriage to satisfy their own sinful desires. And the position that they held was, to, uh, was not taken from a proper interpretation of the scriptures. They believed that since Moses had given consent to having a certificate of divorce written up by a husband, that somehow God had commanded it or put his blessing on this dissolve of the covenant of marriage. But that was not was happening there. That was a false understanding. And we come to know this by reading the Old Testament passage that they try to justify themselves with before Jesus, which is Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. And we read this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her, and writes her a certificate of divorce, and puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband, who sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, and after she has uh, been defiled, for that is an abomination for the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Now, at first, it might be thinking, you might be thinking, this sounds a lot like Hillel, and that's true. But Hillel and the Pharisees mistook the allowance for divorce to mean a freedom to do so whenever one desired. This was a subtle twisting of the scriptures. It was not what Moses intended. He gave a divorce process that would have taken time. The husband had to write his certificate of divorce, give it to uh, his wife, and then require her to leave the house. All of this probably being done in a legal, formal process. 
And J.D. Adams put it this way when referring to this passage in his exceptional book on marriage, divorce, and remarriage in the Bible, which if you want a full picture of this, read that book. So he says this. He says, Moses takes up a particular case, as just described, and in order to eliminate the practice of easy divorce and remarriage that evidently prevailed in the surrounding pagan culture, and that also may have been becoming prevalent among God's people, put an end to capricious actions of the sort. If I'm wrong, I'll just remarry Mary, if when she becomes available again, or if I can induce her to leave her second husband and return to me, was the way some were thinking. No, says Moses in this passage, you'd better think twice before you divorce her, because if you can't get her to remarry you before she marries another, you will have lost the opportunity to do so forever, says Moses. So Moses did not command divorce. He sought to regulate it for the sake of keeping Israel from being judged by God for sexual immorality. The man who divorced his wife should have stayed married to her. Because once she married her second husband, she could not be his wife again. Although they were legally divorced through the certificate, their lifelong Genesis 1 flesh commitment was still in effect until it was broken through the adultery of her second marriage. So this divorce was permitted by Moses, but it was ultimately sinful, which led to the woman's adultery as well as the husband if he was going to remarry. So the proper outcome should have been that the couple was reconciled in their commitment to their marriage or they both stayed single. But that chance was lost after the second marriage defiled the woman, as the text says. Defilement meaning some irreconcilable covenantal break due to the adultery she had committed in the second marriage. Which is why her original husband cannot take her back because it would bring sin upon the land. And Paul had this exact scenario in mind when he said this to the Corinthian church in his first letter to them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 through 11, he says, to the, uh, to the Mary, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife shall not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. So Jesus was telling the Pharisees in our present text that they had misunderstood God's intentions for marriage, that they were divorcing unlawfully, sinfully, due to their hard hearts. If they were truly going to obey God, they should have stayed unmarried, but they had not stayed unmarried. Rather, they were multiplying sin by failing to abide by God's original intent for marriage and his word. Pharisees were guilty of misusing God's word for their own Ends, and they justified their divorces because of the teaching of a popular rabbi in their day. We might say that they had jumped on the bandwagon of pop culture, but it wasn't a blessing. The disruption of marriage due to sin and the sin of divorce is never a blessing. <coughs> their choices had produced spousal abandonment, destruction of their families, and they were leading themselves into sexual sin. Not only that, but they were also causing their new wives to sin because their previous marriage covenants had not been abolished as God had permitted. The refusal to desire God's law that was meant since Genesis 2 led to sin and justice and harm to everyone involved in the situation, just as all sinful divorces do today. Yet as we continue discerning Jesus' teaching here, we must not forget that he gave legitimate grounds for divorce. So he taught that divorce was permissible on proper grounds. Sexual immorality. Now the word he used for sexual immorality is the Greek word porneia. Porneia means sexual immorality or fornication, not just merely adultery. It's a broader term that encapsulates any sort of sexual immorality. Any form of sexual deviation from what God has ordained between a husband and a wife is porneia. Now, this doesn't mean that husbands and wives do not have freedom in their marriage bed. That's a whole different conversation. But what this does mean is that extramarital affairs, pornography, sexually graphic novels, and other such things are outside of the bounds of marital covenantal faithfulness. This does not mean that every marriage that suffers a blow from sexual unfaithfulness by one or both parties must end in divorce, though. The wife or husband of the spouse who has committed porneia is free of sin if they choose to divorce. And I would argue there is freedom in other cases as well, but that's outside the purview of the text. But we must stress 
above all else, that it is always best to pursue reconciliation and marriages before divorce is finalized. Yet, in a fallen world, reconciliation is not always going to work. It's not always going to happen. And at times, divorce is not sinful, but in fact, it is a grace of God to free someone from an extremely wretched marriage. So as we seek to discern Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage, uh, it was necessary for us to travel through all this background to rightly break it down. And so everything we've covered, I hope, helps you understand and helps us rightly understand the full picture behind why Jesus used this test case of divorce against the Pharisees in Luke for chapter 16, verse 18. Again, as we read, everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. The Pharisees were guilty of misusing God's word and law. They were sinful in breaking their marriage covenants because they did not divorce due to pornea. Their divorces were sinful, and they merely justified their actions because they had a legal certificate. If they would have stayed single, it would have only been the divorce that was the sin they were guilty of. However, they remarried, which caused themselves and their new wives, as well as their ex-wives and their new husbands, to fall into the sin of adultery. The topic of divorce is nuanced and complex in the scriptures. It is not simple, but it is not impossible to discern. And so we've broken it down. We've discovered that if divorce is done apart from pornea or other legitimate means, as I briefly mentioned, then that divorce is sinful and leads to the sin of adultery if those persons remarry, which then leads us to our second part of uh, discerning Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage, which is briefly addressing remarriage. So Jesus knew that divorce was an inevitable consequence in a sinful world as he rebuked the Pharisees. He also knew that remarriage was something that would happen as well. And just as divorce can be done sinfully or legitimately, according to Jesus, remarriage can be sinful or legitimate as well. Again, Jesus touched on both divorce and remarriage in our text in verse 18. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. So we've already covered that pornea is legitimate cause for divorce. So if someone has been divorced whose husband or wife committed pornea against them, then they are free to remarry, but with certain stipulations. Only in the Lord, only to a believer. And I've been addressing divorce and remarriage from a Christian perspective because that's what we need to know as the church and as followers of Jesus. So when someone who has legitimately divorced and seeking to remarry as a Christian, they can get remarried without sin, but not to someone who is an unbeliever. Paul says this to the women whose marriage covenants had ended due to their husband's deaths in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39, he says this, Wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but, is, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Death releases someone from the temporal covenant of marriage, legitimately, and they're free to remarry in the Lord because they are without sin. By implication, then, other Christians who have been through a legitimate divorce due to porneo or something else are free to remarry in the Lord as well. But what about all other remarriage? Is all other remarriage that has come about due to a sinful divorce sinful, just as divorce was sinful? The difficult answer we're bound to give by what Jesus taught in the passage we've read today is yes. And if what we've answered is true, then we should be concerned, as the disciples were concerned in Matthew, about the serious covenantal commitment that we make in marriage. We must keep in mind that our marriages are supposed to be small pictures of Christ's church in all its holy splendor and glory. If we're going to break our sacred unions, we must do so within the bounds of what God has said is right. To treat divorce and remarriage as the Pharisees did, haphazardly and unbiblically, will bring great harm to ourselves, our families, our spouses, our churches, and our children even. We will harm the picture of Jesus and his church for unbelievers and as followers of Jesus. That is not something we should desire to partake in. We must treat divorce and remarriage as serious <laughs> matters. 
We must take painstaking efforts to maintain our marriages, if at all possible. And we must do our best to abide by the scripture's call for us to remain single if our marriages break down in sinful divorce, as to allow time for reconciliation, and so that we do not lead ourselves and others into the sin of adultery. Yet the final question we must answer as we briefly address remarriage is, what if my divorce was sinful and my remarriage was sinful too? Well, this is where the good news comes into play concerning these rather weighty and uncomfortable topics. Because the reality is, is that sinful divorce and sinful remarriage are not the unforgivable sin. Let me say that again. The reality is that sinful divorce and sinful remarriage are not the unforgivable sin. It is not that the sins of your past are not serious. They certainly are. You may also experience lasting consequences of those sins that you've committed. And you should seek to avoid repeating them at all costs. Because God does not give us grace that we may continue on in sin. But with that being said, praise God that when we put our faith in the gospel, he does not merely overlook the sins of our past. He expunges them from our records entirely. And he forgets them with a forgiveness that is as far as the east is from the west. And he does not look on our sins anymore, but on his perfect son, Jesus Christ, who covers us with his eternal and all-sufficient blood. And if you've been through a sinful divorce in the past and you know your remarriage was sinful too, do not let it haunt your conscience. The blood of Christ has covered you. Embrace the forgiveness you have in your Lord. And if you're here today or listening online and you've been through a divorce but are not a believer, Jesus Christ offers you hope and eternal life if you rest your faith in Him. You no longer need to bear the weight of your shame and guilt. Nor do you need to harbor resentment, bitterness, or hatred for the person you've hurt or have been hurt by. Be free of your sin and trust in Christ. And if you're the victim of a divorce that you did not want because your spouse was unfaithful and left no room for reconciliation, do not allow Satan to keep you trapped in the shackles of doubt and incorrect belief that you are the one responsible for your spouse's sins. Yes, you're imperfect and you sin, but you are guiltless of the sin of divorce. So find grace before the Lord today and understand that you are free to find a life of partnership and marriage again within the Lord. And if you are considering divorce today, I plead with you to reconsider. There is hope in God's word for you, and I am standing by as are others to help you in your marriage do not let go of the picture of Christ you and your spouse are supposed to be. Press into the gospel that you possess in Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus and desire the gospel, then repent and put your faith in him. So we need to discern Jesus' teaching on divorce and remarriage so that we're knowledgeable of these difficult yet inevitable uh, relational breaks that happened in our fallen world. And I by no means treated this difficult, nuanced topic in its entirety, but as we broke down divorce and briefly addressed remarriage from Luke today, I hope it brought you a greater clarity as to why we should seek obedience to God's word and law in every aspect of our lives. Because if we ignore it, as is in the case of divorce and remarriage, it leads to harm and injustice to all who are involved, whether directly or indirectly. So may it be that we are better equipped to love our God and our neighbors by discerning what Jesus taught concerning divorce and remarriage. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would um, just apply this word to us this morning. Lord, we cannot keep from failing in our covenants of marriage without your help. Lord, so give us grace as we desire to be faithful not only to our marriages, Lord, but faithful to you in maintaining those relationships. Lord, as pictures of your church, Lord, who desire uh, to show the world of what true godly marriages are supposed to look like. And by implication, Lord, what your church and all its holiness and wonder is supposed to look like as well. Lord, this is such a high high calling for us who are married and 
those who seek to be married. So Lord, help us to trust in you, the one who fills us with the power of the Spirit to be able to accomplish any of these things. Lord, it's in that power that we ask that you sustain us, Lord, in our marriages and all of these things, Lord, and it's in the name of the one who supplies us with that power, Jesus Christ our Lord, that we pray this morning. Amen. Amen.